Hello again and welcome into another episode of March to the Pod presented by Eternal Roofing. Ben is going to bring us an update on how spring practice is going for the football team. The Diamond Cats are on a big time heater and the transfer portal is open for basketball and Ben's going to tell us what that means, who's been in and who who's leaving us. I'm your host. Corey Hope, the non-FBS insider at Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Find me on your favorite social media channels at Corey Hogue Sports. It's C-O-R-Y-H-O-G-U-E Sports. I'm joined by the creator and manager of Sports of SHSU. Again, all of one word on Twitter and Instagram. The chief operating officer of the Cat Fund and proud Bearcat alum Ben Sorrells, who is going to fill in the blank with this question. It took your bracket blank games until it was completely busted. Ooh, I would say, I would say the entirety of the first day. I would say, first day, I think I, I was doing okay, um, but yeah, after about the first day, you kind of lose hope. And I think I had ten of the Sweet Sixteen teams, and I have seven of the eight Elite Eight teams. But the first round was a little rough. I have no idea. And, and you know why? Because I stopped counting. That's how bad my bracket was. I picked a team to go to the national title game that lost in the first round. The Kentucky? That's what everyone asks. And no, I am not that on the big Kentucky. <laughs> I knew better than that, right? No, no. I'm not dumb enough to pick Kentucky. I'm the dumb one that picked St. Mary's to make it to the championship. I had a bracket with them going to the final four. They... They were on a heater there at the end of the year. Well, and they they played well. I thought they had a good chance, but, you know, hey, it's March. March. There's a reason why we do it. It's fun. Uh, I am last, near last in every basketball pool I've done for men. Uh, But that reversed for me on the women's side. I've done very well in the women's bracket uh, right there near the top. So pretty happy with that. Yeah, you must have gone all chalk on the women's side if you're doing well. Well, first off, if you're on the women's side, you typically want to go chalk for the first two rounds. Not near as much as you did years ago. Like five, six years ago, you just put the top four seeds advancing, and then we had fun. Uh, Nowadays, man, you do get some upsets, and I picked some of those. I I even – I was pleasantly surprised at how much women's basketball has grown, how much better it's gotten because I am picking 12 seeds to beat fives. And I feel very confident in that. So uh, really glad to see that too, because it gives me more, more fun basketball to watch uh, on uh, like a Monday and Tuesday night or whatever. Yeah. And shout out to our uh, conference USA uh, teammate, uh, middle Tennessee uh, as 11 seed went in their first round game and then pushing LSU pretty hard in their second round game. So that was cool to see a, a conference USA team do that. Yeah, not if I didn't pick them, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, right? they, they they went, I think it was 21-0 in conference between the conference tournament and regular season play. They they were really good. Really I picked good. 77% of the teams right, games right. Uh, and <laughs> you ready for this, Ben? Hit me. I, I actually pay, and I, I have it right here, and I, of course, can always take a screen grab for proof. Uh, I picked Middle Tennessee to, to win their first round game. There you go. There you go. I had that one picked. I had, uh, I have a green check mark, my pick, MTSU over Louisville. Uh, and so, hey, look at that. And I also picked LSU to win. Uh, the, that's, you know, for all funsies' sake. Let's see. I did not pick. I picked Fairfield to get to the Sweet 16. Uh, they were a fun in, story. Indiana ruined that one. Yeah, the 33-point loss was really fun to watch. Um, of course, I've got South Carolina. I have uh, Notre Dame. I had Oregon State. Uh, Texas, I had. Uh, I had Gonzaga, NC State, Stanford. I had Duke and UConn. I had... USC and Baylor, right? I had UCLA, LSU, right? And Iowa, right? I did not have Colorado. I actually had Drake beating Colorado and then Kansas State beating Drake. 
So that that didn't work out as well either. Pretty, I mean, what was that, 14 of 16 or 15 of 16? I think so, yeah, it's at least 14. So that, yeah. that's not bad for the women's side. Yeah, you'll take that. And I picked an upset in the first round, and it happened. So, yeah, you know. there you go. Now that you're, uh, it's the first time I've really looked. <laughs> I'm a bracketologist. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I tell you what. I'll give everyone my bracket. You give me $10, and I'll give you all the winners for somebody. I don't know who, but somebody's going to win money off your ass. <laughs> don't know who, but somebody will. I don't know who's winning money, but it ain't going to be you, and I'm getting some money because you're paying me for the pick. So how about yep. we do that next year? Yep. <laughs> Hey, uh, it is spring, and with, with spring comes a night where, let me tell you, my man, Wichita Falls dodged a big one this last week. We had a all the conditions were favorable for tornadoes, except the dew point was quite high enough. And that storm passed like a mile and a half from my house, and then it went right over downtown Wichita Falls. Um, and and it really got me thinking about uh, our friends over at Eternal Roofing and how I was thankful that we didn't need to call them this time. But at the same time, Ben, it reminded me that if it is storm season and shingles come and shingles go during this time of year, and, and if you need some roof repair, we know some people to call. Yeah, and that is uh, Taylor and the team at Eternal Roofing. It is definitely that time of year. I know my brother's house just missed a big hail storm um, in the Houston area a week or two ago. So, yeah, get ahead of it. it but if you do need something, uh, if there is a storm that rolls through, they are the people to go to at Eternal Roofing. Speaking of that, I think we need to ask Taylor if they do, if they cover, like, uh, those solar panels. Because I saw a solar panel farm that got obliterated by hail this week. Yeah, I never thought of that. I mean, those things are probably useless after – a good little hail <laughs> i know right like it's hard to catch sun if you although you see them on houses and they don't i think it's just i think that just tells you the size of the hail they had at that place right yeah it must have been huge oh goodness man well the, we were getting uh that night that storm passed through here we were we were getting uh it was nickel to quarter size but it was grow. It, it was building fast you could just tell those stones started out pea size and they didn't stay that way for long and no hail is fun no no, no especially it when it hits you in the head so remember that when you're in a hail storm get out of it so it doesn't hit you in the head that Sounds is like a personal experience it is it is but <laughs> <laughs> damn it ben you take me off task every time Junior high track meet, Seymour, Texas. I'm doing a triple jump. <laughs> it starts hailing. I'm running in a hailstorm trying to get to the bus because it's the closest thing for cover. <laughs> I I get to the dark bus and it stops. <laughs> so forget about the triple jump. Yeah, I didn't care about a triple jump at that point, but I was running down when it started hailing and everybody said go. <laughs> Uh, we weren't smart enough to get away when it started lightning back then, though. Just kept going. That, see, okay, here's – first off, let's finish up with our friends at Eternal Roofing. And Taylor and the company, if you need if you need a roof inspection or repair, call our friends at Eternal Roofing. Email them. You can, the email is taylor at eternalroofingtx.com. You want to give them a call. Montgomery office area code 936-215-8539. Hill Country's area code 830-251-5673. Uh, and I'm sure he's going to be just thrilled with uh, talking about a junior high track meet from, geez, when was I in junior high? 30 plus years ago? 2008. 2008. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's see. 304-0607. I think I was back home in 2008. If I wasn't, I was in Germany. Yeah. I wasn't in Korea yet. I was in fifth or sixth grade. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Almost junior high. <laughs> I think my wife was like getting into college at that point. So, you know, I was overseas and everybody else was living a life over here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, living a life. So anyway, 
boy, you got me off on you got me off already on the track story, man, with the weather oh, yeah. and how how would you even know that's personal experience? I mean, it's just so random. I mean, when people talk about hail, they don't talk about getting hit in the head usually. Well, when you've been hit in the head, you don't forget. It. Yeah, then that's the first thing you bring up. That's right. You tell people if it starts hailing, get to a place where you're not getting hit in the head. School bus. And, yeah. And then it, it's very deflating when you run all the way there and it stops and they're like, all right, everybody head back. <laughs> oh my gosh. Squirrel. Any, anyway, speaking of head injuries, football is back in practice session, Ben. You like that transition, dude? There you go. <laughs> yeah, this show, this show is completely off the rails today. So just hang on. We're going to get through it. Spring practice is going on today, and we got a lot of different areas. And if you haven't checked it out or you're not a member of Cat Fund, we'll tell you how to become a member later. We won't scold you yet, but that'll come soon. Some lashes, noodles, things are involved, right? So if you have, if you are a member, you should have been over on the exclusive page on Cat Fans for the Cat Fund members because Ben had a tremendous write up on what's been happening in practice. We got some categories that I want to go over here, starting with injuries. Ben, that always seems to be the one that we want to see the most. My question is because I, I don't want to, I want people to get on the Cat Fund and go read your stuff. My question is, how many of these injuries of players that miss should we be concerned about? And how many of them fall into a category of just need some time to heal from a, a prior injury or a surgery or whatever? Yeah, that, and there were a lot of guys that were out. Um, probably, I mean, I listed probably 10 to 12 notable ones. It was probably pushing 20 total that were out um, for the spring practice. And that's kind of to be expected one with the spring, just being so close to the previous season and two with just how many injuries you had last year. I mean, down to your seventh, eighth running back, you were really depleted at O-line just to name a couple. Um, but none of them really seem to be uh, creeping into training camp or into next season. It's kind of a just uh, rest them now, um, have them ready for the summer, have them ready for training camp. And a lot of them are guys that have been with the program for a couple of years. And so, you know what you're going to get out of them, which is a good thing. And they've been through pr plenty of spring balls and they'll be ready for training camps. So nothing really too lingering that will go into the summer training camp kind of thing. But there's definitely going to be probably 10 to 20 guys that are going to miss the majority of the spring, if not all of it. Casey Keeler really believes and buys into being a veteran, right? Like if, if this was a person that transferred in uh, – if you're if you're a freshman, a transfer, still learning, you're usually going to be out there in this spring practice. But if you're a veteran guy, someone who's been around three or four years, Keeler knows you know the offense. He knows what he's going to get out of you. It, it's almost like right now, especially on the offensive side of things this year, because there is a new defensive staff, that a lot of the ones sitting out are offense because he – Artie knows what he's going to get, and it gives him a chance to kind of develop some more depth behind it. Right, and, and just to kind of bring up an, an example along those lines, Zach Herbacek was the guy that we saw come back in a limited capacity at the end of last season, but he's a guy that's going to miss uh, most, if not all, of this spring or be limited when he does uh, participate. And he's a guy that's been in this offense for a couple of years now. He's been with the staff for a couple of years, and you know what you're going to get out of a Zach Herbacek. There's no point in pushing – um, that knee injury he had, and you might as well just rest him up and have him 100% ready to go for uh, training camp in, in August, ready to go into the season. Yeah, you you can't – let me say this. You can lose someone for a season right now, right? And, and sometimes non-contact injuries, they happen. It's a freak thing. Uh, but you really, especially those that you know are coming back off of injury, you're going to limit that contact. You're going to limit – some of that work so that they will be healthiest when it comes time for fall camp and really get wound up for the season. Right. Yeah. And I mean, we saw how important it is to be healthy and ready to go when the season starts. And so 
you don't want guys coming back from an injury and then kind of have that injury start to nag at them again going into this year. You need guys fully healthy, ready to go, because um, the depth is definitely tested at the FBS level, and we saw that this last year. Well, it definitely is, and how you help build depth is with recruiting, which is in full swing again, and there are a lot of recruits who are getting to visit and kind of stand alongside the injured players. (laughs) Unfortunately, they get to see all the depth issues that come on with it. Uh, what What do you have on the recruiting side for us, Ben? Yeah, I think we, we've all, there were five official visitors that are in the portal right now that were on campus and at practice this weekend, and you can see those in the exclusive forum. But just kind of looking at what Sam Houston's targeting um, right now, I think the two big areas that they're really pushing for is an interior defensive lineman, probably two of them. There were two on campus this last weekend. And then you're looking at probably one or two tackles as well. There were two tackles here this weekend. Um, and then some other areas where I know the team would like to add a little bit of depth is running back and corner. There was a corner, a uh, transfer corner that was on campus as well this weekend. So you're looking probably mainly at the interior defensive lineman and adding one or two tackles. And then I also wouldn't be surprised if they added a corner and a running back as well. Okay, so when you said tackles, you're talking defensive line. Deep, tackles on both ends, yeah. Defensive both tackles sides. and then tackles on offense, yeah. And when you say corner, it sounds really close to coroner. And Corey goes, huh? Yeah, no, I don't yeah, know none, where none my head is. Corner, cornerback. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I understand. I just don't know why my brain immediately translated that. <laughs> That's yeah. all I'm saying. Hopefully we don't have any of those this season. No, we do not want any of those on any season. That right. is uh, – uh, I've, I've honestly, unfortunately – there's been too much of that. You know, there's always something it seems like every year right now that uh, not necessarily across Texas, but somewhere uh, across a conference or something that I cover or know or, or whoever, and there's been a lot of that stuff. And so whether it be on field, off field, good Lord, just, you know, I guess life happens. And so yeah. life happens on the football field too. Yeah. Sometimes. Hopefully we can get a corner back. Yeah, Just hopefully, and not a coroner. Because <laughs> if you get a coroner back, you're not going to have any problem <laughs> seeing seeing how healthy somebody is. Like there will be no, there will probably be no coronary attack, but there could be right a really bad defense played. <laughs> we'll see. We will see. We're hoping for the best. <laughs> Speaking of the defensive side of the ball, there is a completely new defensive staff. Uh, Skyler Cassidy is the defensive coordinator taking over. Uh, some interesting notes that you had on the Cat Fund page there, Ben. Uh, give us a little bit about what Cassidy is bringing and what you saw from the defense. Yeah, I mean, I was impressed by Cassidy and just kind of his, I mean, a lot of people know he's a younger guy. I think he's only 29 going on 30, but I was impressed with the way he was able to teach guys, kind of command the room. Um, and worked throughout the practice, which I thought was impressive, especially for someone his age and someone being so new. So that was encouraging. Got to see a little bit about what the defensive scheme looks like, and it looks very similar to what they use at ACU, kind of three down linemen, Isaiah Nixon kind of standing up on the line as well. And then you've got um, two other linebackers and five DBs. So it's kind of a three three five four two five kind of look, which is what we saw at ACU. Um, And this is the first time in a while that the defensive staff has had a lot of turnover. And that did kind of show at times um, a big emphasis was communication. The offense was probably the better side um, during that practice, uh, during the seven on seven and 11 on 11. Um, But that was kind of to be expected. The offense is now in year two of their system and brings back a lot of guys and the defense lost a couple pieces and they're under some new leadership. So Um, Got to kind of see some schemes, see how Cassie operates. Um, And, yeah, I'm encouraged to see what the defense can do this year. I can bring back some good talent, brought in a couple of nice pieces from the portal, and I think it's just going to take a little while to put it all together. My concern is not where they're at because they're exactly where they should be right now. The The offense is a little ahead of the defense. My concern about that, and last year it was flipped as we knew it should have been going into it. My concern comes with 
the offense struggled last year, especially early in the season with so many moving parts and so many new changes. If the defense struggles, that can really lead to some really difficult times on a football field uh, and can have a major effect on the record this year. Just kind of curious what you think about that right now. Yeah, I, last year at this time, it was the defense winning nine out of 10 plays. It was that kind of domination from the defense. This year, it's the offense probably winning two out of three plays. The defense is definitely holding their own. You can tell they're a step behind. I think they're going to be okay. Um, obviously, I don't know if they're going to be where they were this last year when you were probably a top two or three defense in the conference. But I think they're going to be okay. And, I mean, just because they lost the battle, I mean, it's not nearly as bad as what the offense looked like last year. They still showed some good stuff. But, um, yeah, they're just a little bit behind where the offense is. So we'll put the defense right now at average, which is good if that's where you're starting at with a new staff right now. You're in the spring. Uh, The offense, would you put that at what you're seeing at the average or above average, or is it just really hard to tell because they were so bad last year? Yeah, I th- it's still so early, so I think it's hard to tell. But the last month of the season, this was a team that averaged 30 points a game, and we they didn't even have really any of their top weapons. I mean, and so you come into this year with Noah Smith, Ife Dei, Quavez Humphreys, John Gentry, Zach Herbacek, um, a system that guys are familiar with and are comfortable in now. And so I don't know if it's going to be a top two or three offense, but I think it could be maybe three, maybe four in the conference. I don't see any reason why they can't be slightly above average coming into this season. I think you have a slight upgrade at quarterback, whoever you go with um, as your starter, and then you return a lot of weapons and it's year two in the system. So um, hoping for probably an offense, it's kind of in the three to four range in conference USA would kind of be my hope and expectation. Okay, so let me ask it this way. Is the offense where you expected ahead or behind in relation to where you expected coming into the spring? I would say it's ahead. Um, Just because, I mean, you lose your quarterback, which was a big piece, and you've got three guys right now taking reps with the ones. And so to see all three of them play really well, it shows me that the system and that guys are bought in no matter who's – running the ship. Um, So that was really encouraging to me. So I think they're a little bit ahead of where I thought they would be at this time. And go a little into that QB battle, because you just said there are three guys uh, battling for that. What is, what are you hearing and when might a decision be made? Yeah, I think we'll probably know a decision earlier than we have the past few years from what it sounds like, uh, which is pretty much the day of the game. But right now, three guys are splitting reps. Um, the three guys being Grant Gunnell, who's your returner from last year, and then Hunter Watson and the Central Michigan transfer, Jace Bauer. Um, and I think part of that is I think Jace is probably going to be the guy long term. But Grant's been in this system a year, knows it really well, um, showed he can play at this level. And so he's going to get reps with the ones. Jace, like I said, he's probably going to be the starter when it's all said and done. So he's going to get reps with the ones. And then Hunter Watson was really impressive. I mean, this is a guy that just won a JUCO national title. And even if he doesn't get the starting job, I think you could see him on the field in some capacity. Reminds me a lot of Trapper Panel the last few years, how you run some gadget plays for him. So right now it's really early. All three guys are getting reps. But um, from what I'm hearing, it's probably going to dwindle down to two, maybe one by the end of this spring. And especially in the fall, it'll be one or two guys and not all three. So who in Ben's mind has the lead right now? Yeah, right now, I would have to say it's Bauer. He, you brought him in, a guy that started nine games at Central Michigan. Um, he's still really early in the system, um, but he was impressive. I really liked what I saw, and he fits the offense really, really well, which I think is the reason why you brought him in. He's a guy with FBS experience um, that started at the previous school. You're probably bringing him in to start. He fits your system really well. So what I think it's all said and done, it's going to be Bauer, but obviously he's still got to go out and win the job and, and, and play well this spring. Is Gunnell the third team QB this year? Or uh, let me say this, is should his talent range put him as third string this year? I don't think his 
I think Ganell has the talent to be the number one on this team. One, I don't know if he's consistent enough to be the number one. And two, out of the three quarterbacks, his game is not very well suited for this system. Um, Bauer and Watson are re they're really big dual threat guys. I mean, they've got size. They can move really well. They've got experience, um, and they've won a lot, and they can really show they can run the ball, pass the ball. Um, and Gunnell, he's really more of a pro-style quarterback. He really wants to air it out and doesn't use his legs a ton. So I think he has the talent when he's on his game to to be the number one, but um, I don't think he's consistent enough, one, and then he doesn't fit the system as well as the other two guys. Well, he was always a curious one when they, when they got him because he didn't fit – the style of quarterback they typically go after. But he's been, and I know this is not the time, to, we're not psychoanalyzing Grant Gunnell today. That's not the intent. But he's been at a few different places. He's had a difficult time. I don't know. You might have hit it there, consistency. You know, you coaches like they're going to go with who they know and what they know they're going to get out of someone. And if you've got a guy that can give you six great, great throws, but the other four are not, it's not consistent enough for coaches to trust you. Right. And I think with Gunnell, if you run the offense that he's best suited for, you're going to have to throw the ball a lot. And um, that's just not really what this office offense is. You really want to mix in the RPO game. And I know the team is really excited about what Bauer and Watson can do, how they can alleviate pressure off the run game with the legs themselves. And then also in the RPO game, um, how their legs can open up the ability to throw the ball as well. So Gunnell just doesn't really offer that. I think he can do it a little bit, but I mean, he's got the high end talent when he's at his best, he can do it. I just don't know if he's going to end up being the guy, but we'll see. I mean, whoever, whoever gets the job is going to have to go out and win it right now. I think it's going to be Bauer but there's still a long way to go. Well, and like you said, it, it's almost, it's a different style. You would almost have to change your entire system. If he's your starting quarterback, you'd have to go to more of a vertical type Pittsburgh Steelers type of offense uh, under Roethlisberger. And, and we've seen out since Roethlisberger and the fantastic whiteouts leave. If you don't have the burners, the vertical offense stalls out pretty quick. Uh, so it would be a it would be a change of personnel too, right? Like I mean, Sam Houston's personnel is built for a dual threat quarterback. Um, I, I I'm curious if the addition of Gunnell last year had more to do with just kind of making sure you had a veteran presence on there just in case you needed to turn to that. Right. And you didn't know what Keegan Shoemaker was going to look like at the FBS level. Um, you knew Gunnell was going to, he was going to be at least competent if you needed him to start every single game. And he was a veteran in a room where Jordan Yates had just transitioned to running back. Um, Xavier Ward was still very raw. Silas Gomez was a freshman. So you needed another guy regardless. And it just helped that he had that division one experience and he could be your starter if you really needed him to but i think keegan shoemaker did just enough and he did a fine job let's end this on a positive note who are some guys that have been standouts in the the first couple first week or so yeah i think the and i mean it, it sounds obvious but the first one has to be noah smith i mean just unbelievable the show he put on and every one-on-one -on -one drill he was in every time the team went into seven on seven or eleven on eleven I mean, he looks twice as good as he even did this last year, and um, he was an all-conference guy this last year. So he is going to be awesome. Um, so he's the first one. Uh, a guy that we saw some at the end of last year with uh, some injuries, he, he got some more time, was Adrian Murdoch. He was really impressive. He's got some really good speed. That was really impressive to see. And then um, on the defensive end, I think Isaiah Nixon looked really good. He's going to be your edge guy this year. He had a big year last year. Was also in the Dave Campbell's, uh, I think, top edge rushers a couple days ago. So he was he was good to see. And then Javon Leon looks good, which I thought was encouraging since he uh, his season ended a couple of games early with an elbow injury. So it was good to see him back. Looked like he was at full force, and he should be really good again this year. 
Yes, and by the way, in case you're missing it, Mike Craven on TexasFootball.com is putting out his Texas 10s, top 10s at each position, and there are some cats on it. Uh, Some cats are getting some love, and you know what? That is nice to see because it's not easy to make one of those lists in the state of Texas at the FBS level. Yeah, 13 teams. I know KV and Gaither was on um, the the linebacker list that came out yesterday, and He's a guy that's still kind of limited. He went through most of practice, but he missed the last game, game and a half or so of last year. So he he wasn't out there the entire time, but um, he's definitely another name to watch on the defensive end, and he was on that list as well. And, and you can find all of those. The Texas 10s are on texasfootball.com backslash college. It will take you there. Uh, you've got that. You've got a, a UTRGV heading to the Southland Conference. We're not talking FCS stuff, though, are we, Ben? No, we don't, we don't talk about our little brother. We, we don't talk about Bruno either. Right? Right. Speaking of little brother, you think SFA yeah. goes back to the Southland? Maybe, but I'll I'll give you this, this question, too. I mean, I think there's a legit shot talking about your question. Um, do you know how long the SFA baseball losing streak is at right now? Oh, no, God. Games? Uh, not good. Uh, yeah, 22. It's not good. 22 in a row. You, you hate to see it. Listen, that's an athletic department that a few years ago, before they made a move, was at the top of their game and beating Duke and things of that nature, right? It's not there now. And I, I'm starting to think that move – I, I'm wondering, I'm curious, let me, let me do it this way, Ben. We got some, shoot, we got nothing but time, right? Let's just go ahead and randomly roll off into Ben's thoughts on what Corey's questions are. All right. Do you think part of the impetus behind Sam Houston really pushing to get to Conference USA so quickly is they realized that the WAC was going to be just as big a money drain, so they might as well get a little more prestige and, in the end, a little better financial situation with it? Yeah, I mean, the financial situation, I think, was a big part, uh, a huge part of it. You get TV money, you get – there's a couple different other revenue streams that are – come like uh, NCAA tournament money, um, and then – you kind of saw the writing on the wall with there's going to be a bigger fee to move up. And you got in just before that. I mean, $5 million for Sam Houston would have been a tough entry fee. So from a financial standpoint, I think they definitely kind of saw it. I mean, let's talk travel though. Yeah. Oh yeah. For, for sure. I mean, from a travel perspective, I mean, it's not much better than the WAC, but you've got ways you can supplement the cost at that point with with but different revenue streams. That's the thing. Here's here's my point about this and why the WAC is not a place if you're going to be an FCS football program. Uh, and, and for all these, like look, the UTRGV, they're saving over twenty five thousand miles per year combined in travel. I get it. That's how the Southland is a gas tank league. That's how they sell themselves. It works. That's awesome. But you know what? There's a lot more people that might be seeing the grass ain't always greener. And I think another thing to to add to the WAC, uh, I don't know, whatever's going on with the WAC, the vision that was sold, the teams coming into the WAC was we're close to becoming an FBS conference. Like we're going to get back to be an FBS conference. And I just don't think that was ever really going to happen. And so once you kind of saw that as well, I think that was also another reason that you jumped ship and moved up. The the United Athletic Conference really, I think, for a lot of people was like, showed them they've been sold a bill of goods maybe they weren't ready for. Right. Man, what a great conversation for another day. Uh, maybe a story on TexasFootball.com. Huh, there you go. We'll see. We are a podcast on the Republic of Football Network and an extension of Dave Campbell's Texas Football. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on the various social media platforms. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, threads sometimes. At March to the Pod, it's all one word, March the number two, the pod. And hello to those watching on Dave Campbell's YouTube page, I have a very special hat today, different one, new hat today, Ben. This one is the 
Uh, typically, they're known as the Amarillo Sod Poodles. Do you know what a Sod Poodle is? Let's start there. I I don't actually. I, I've known that's their mascot, but I don't really know. What, I feel like it's I. I it's a prairie dog. I I was thinking that I just you should have said it then. Well, no, I was thinking it, but I couldn't think of the name. I saw what they looked like in my head, but I couldn't think of the name. A prairie dog apparently is also known as a sod poodle. There you go. Uh, so they are the Amarillo sod poodles. Well, they have the ninths like everybody in minor league baseball, and this hat is the calf fries. C A L F fries and if you're on youtube and or if you're not and you want to see more of what it is it is a calf with a cowboy hat sitting in a burning skillet and his face is showing that it you know some things are on fire down there yeah and i just to clear it up for the for the non-youtube listeners it's f-r-y-s not f-r-i-e-s that the like french fries was the first thing that came to mind so yeah it is a calf in a pan that is being fried <laughs> and he don't look happy no i wouldn't be either he looks he looks scared <laughs> i would i would be as well <laughs> you can google the amarillo calf fries or go to the amarillo team shop which i was at at the uh park there when i was in amarillo last week which is partly why we didn't have a show last week ben Corey was traveling the state of texas following basketball and by the time i got back uh, and got done with work functions it was uh thursday and nobody in the country pays attention to us on thursday anyway when it's march madness i guess you could put it that way yeah i mean who's gonna right who's like <laughs> oh march madness let's see if march to the pod has a new episode we're back, though. We are back. Also, that work function, chicken and pickle, man. That's where we went. Went to chicken. Right, that and place pickle. is. I've heard that place is cool. That They're was popping fun. up everywhere. That was fun. That was fun. I showed them that uh, the old man's a little crafty. There you go. I never played pickleball before, but I'm sold. Only because when I saw that the ball was like a wiffle ball, I was like, "Oh, you could put massive spin on this sucker." Oh yeah. Yeah. You need yeah. you don't need to be athletic or the most rangy person. It's gotta be crafty. Just gotta be able to reach a little bit and you know, get that little slice down so that way the air comes out of the ball and when it hits, it just like dies right there. Uh my daughter hated that when, when we would play tennis and I'd put through those drop shots all the time. Oh yeah. I I'm I'm good at that at table tennis. I've never played pickleball, so I don't you know should what my try. Game really I think like I, th there. I think you would like pickleball. I think I would. I just haven't gotten around to it just yet. Well, then you need to. You know something else you need to do is make sure you subscribe to Dave Campbell's Texas Football at texasfootball.com backslash subscribe. We've got packages taking you all the way up to the max. It's fifty dollars a year that gets you three magazines and get you all of our content that's locked candidates piece for football coaches. You get Oh goodness, you got podcasts in there. You get access to everything. If you if you like high school football, Tep and Step alone will talk enough in a podcast to make it worth your subscription. <laughs> I've never seen people that do uh well, I have. I do it. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember Ben, I got in trouble last year for uh a two hour long preview for the uh non FBS. And so I can't say I don't know how people go two hours about it because I, I could do it. I was going to say, if you got in trouble for two, you might as well have just gone three at that point. Might have to raise it next year to let them know that I got they got off easy last year. Right. There you go. That's how you do it. That's how that's how you get along with your bosses a lot better. I mean, if you're going to get, get in trouble already, just just push it a little farther. No, I'm just showing them that, you know, if you're going to be mad about two hours, wait till you see what's, what could be. Oh, yeah. So that next year when it's – be thankful. Exactly. There you go. I got to give them a reason to be thankful. Oh, two hours this year? That's not too bad. Oh, Corey <laughs> took it easy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time that we give our friends at Eternal Roofing another shout out. Uh, you know, we we talked to you earlier about the roofing, and they they can do they're going to give you free roof inspections. 
and they can install and repair it. But what they can also do is general contracting services. They can paint the interior, exterior, your home or business. They can install gutters, garage doors, floors, any woodworking you need, maybe sheetrock. And Ben, it is we are recording this on, I believe, if I change my calendar correctly today, on Wednesday, March 27th, 2024. It's the year of our Lord. And uh, that means we're awfully close to a certain time of season. And it's not Easter. It's not Easter. That is that is soon. But the, it, what I think you're mentioning is Christmas, which, I mean, we're only seven, eight, nine months away from those Christmas lights starting to go up. Well, 12 minus almost four. That's eight plus some weeks. And then you and then you put them up a little early. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Do you put up Easter lights? Do you think that's a thing or could be a thing? uh easter lights i don't think so but easter decoration yeah for sure we should start putting up easter lights that way trendsetter uh, yeah well that way taylor and the company has some some lights to install not just christmas time they can do it in the nice spring weather i think it could catch on i think we need to start an easter light you know what we just need to get like some land and put up some whatever things you put up for christmas lights and just call them easter lights there you go first of a kind i can't think of anybody that's done that before if you need christmas lights or you would like to have christmas lights installed and called them easter lights uh, we know the people to call it's our friends over at eternal roofing the hill country office numbers area code 830-251-5673 montgomery office area code 936-215-8539 and you can email Taylor at eternal roofing tx.com. Uh, you know, ask him, email and ask him about Easter lights. Tell him you heard it on March to the pod. I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure we'll get a call as well. I could see that. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hey, I, we would know people are listening. <laughs> that is true. That is true. The baseball team is uh, playing really, really well, Ben, they went 11 and six in their last 17 games, which I think going into it, we said that was the toughest stretch of the regular season. And the fact that they finished with 11 wins, neither one of us were expecting that they, they outperformed and they, they lost two of three to DBU, but it wasn't like they did. They, they left the field knowing they can play with a DBU. And I think that's important right now. Uh, get that confidence built up a little more because come conference tournament time, now you know there's nobody in that field that that you can't play with. Right, yeah. I mean, 11-6 and six over the last 17. And I know we were looking at it from a 12-game perspective um, a couple of weeks ago and saying if they could get six, that would be really good. They ended up with eight, I believe it was, going eight and four in that 12. And then um, – yeah, I mean, it's a team that's been playing really well, and the pitching has just continued to stay hot, and I think it's only gotten even better the past week, seeing Marshall Wales come back. He's thrown five innings and given up one run over the last two weeks since returning. You've seen the true freshman, Noah, not Noah Kendrick, but Ryan, Ryan Peterson. He started against Rice last night. He's been really, really impressive. And so we had probably eight arms that we felt really good in, and now you can add two more to that list. And so I think you can roll into a conference tournament with 10 arms that you feel really, really good about. And a lot of them that can go multiple innings as well. So I like where this team's at. Offense is still doing just enough to win. The pitching has stayed hot and you're getting healthy. So, um, yeah, it's it's been a good couple of weeks. You got through that really brutal part of your schedule and um, conference play. You're right in the thick of it now. And the, at 17 and 9, I think that they are in a good position uh, if they maintain and play really well through conference, keep, keep going. Uh, I think they're in a position to be a, probably a, a confirm, a pretty firm at large bid going into the conference tournament. Yeah. And baseball America came out with their first projections for regionals. It was really the first projections I've seen really for any site for regionals. I know we're pretty early, only about a third to half of the way through the season. But they have Sam Houston as an at-large in the A&M Regional, along with A&M, Texas, and Bryant. Um, so that would be a really fun regional. <laughs> they you put get... Texas in the regional. 
Yeah, Texas. Have they Texas. watched? Have they watched baseball yet this year? The Longhorns are putrid. Yeah, they're not very good. They're but, not good. Uh, that would be a fun regional, though. That would be a very fun regional. Yeah, well, yeah, because it would pretty much come down to Texas A&M and Sam Houston. Right, and I mean, you saw, we the saw that really, really push A&M a week or two ago, and it was a game that they maybe could have won if it wasn't for a couple of errors and base running errors. So, Do you see I mean, Houston Christian only lost 6-3 to A&M? And I think Prairie View only lost 11-9. Crazy. Yeah, Texas lost to Texas A&M Corpus Christi 4-1. to one. I know, shock is up, right? Yes. You know, <laughs> and look, congratulations. Make fun of the Southland all you want. They've got some you didn't baseball. meet them. So the Southland still has some decent baseball. They do. They really do. They're an underrated baseball conference, in my opinion. They they have been for a little while. They're not great. They're not, you know, you know, SEC, Big 12, anything like that. But it's not, it's not the worst conference in baseball. Right. And I mean, Lamar looks very, very good. And that's a team that Sam Houston plays in the midweek in a week or two. And so that'll be a fun one because Lamar, they've won 12 of their last 13. And they're a really good team. You can't take them lightly. Well, it is going to be fun. And the pitching is still doing well. Uh, and, and you know, the thing I, I think uh, I enjoyed seeing the most is that the bats have really started performing a lot better here over the last few weeks, which we were hoping – Hoping they would, but, you know, 10 runs against New Mexico State, 19 in the second game, six in game three that was a loss, 18 against Baylor, put up five. They struggled against DBU, but that is high-quality pitching that they struggled against. They come back out yesterday, put up six more against Rice. I really like how the offense is starting to get going. Right, and I mean, it's still not the offense we saw last year, which was a top-10 offense in the country, but it's doing just enough, and it's right at about average, I feel like now. And if you've got an average offense and an elite pitching staff, that's how you can win games. And if the offense can continue to do just enough, they're going to be just fine. And I think a lot of it has to do with Malachi Lott really coming on. Walker Yannick has just been really, really good. Um, And then a guy like Caleb Cotton has just found a way to kind of create pressure and so you, you've kind of found the formula that works for you and you're doing just enough to win games and, and put up runs. Baseball's an easy sport, man. I tell that to the to the flying squirrels, the seventh and eighth grade rec team in Burke Burnett, Texas. I tell them this all the time. Baseball's an easy game. Whoever catches, throws, and hits the best, they're going to win, right? Whoever scores more do, runs will win too. You don't do that. Well, if you hit better. You're going to win. And if you don't do those, those are called mistakes. Right. And you want to limit the mistakes. And and I'll tell you, dude, Flying Squirrels had opening day last week. It was a beautiful Saturday for an opening day. The sun was out. The kids were out. Burt Burnett did a great job putting on a community event. Everything was wonderful. Uh, And the Flying Squirrels survived uh, that day, 6-5. We gave up five runs. Our pitcher, it was his first time to pitch ever in a game. Uh, and so he went the complete four. He, well, he, we played three innings, I think, maybe four. He went the entire time, whatever it was. And uh, threw about 77 pitches, really did a good job. Uh, the problem was that we had a couple of mistakes that ended up costing three runs. So in reality, our pitcher went out there and pitched his first ever game against uh, live competition and gave up two runs. So that is uh, two runs in an hour and 15 minutes, I think we played, or an hour and a half or something like that. So uh, that's that's pretty solid. Uh, the bats, obviously, six runs are pretty good. The third base coach was excellent at sending those guys, getting them running. Uh, is his name Corey? It is. How'd you know? <laughs> you know, it's funny to me, Ben, when, when we're playing baseball. And Gabe, by the way, I also want to say sputters. The Wichita Falls Sputters didn't do well in their first game, but they won last night. Uh, He says five to nothing. We're going to believe him. Uh, And and Gabe had two hits, including one nice hit to the area of where the shortstop would normally have been uh, last night. But it's coach pitch, so they're first and second graders. And so the shortstop may or may not be in his position when the ball is hit. Yep. It's just how it is. But Gabe did a great job. Hit two solid hits. Really proud of him. 
Hey, that's, that's as long as you get on, it doesn't matter how you do it. Just get on base. That's right. All you, all you do is get on base. You hit the ball, drop your bat and run. That's, that's what we worked on the last week with him. Yep. If you hit the ball, you drop your bat and run. There you go. <laughs> Take off, run like the wind. Yeah, well, he does supersonic speed, puts his arms behind him. Whatever, man. It's not like he's got real speed anyway. <laughs> not yet. He's my son. Baseball's a good sport for him. He can outthink people. There you go. Yeah, and I was going to say the the last thing I wanted to add on actually on our baseball. We're not done team. yet with baseball. We're going to come back to it. I was just riffing. Okay, I yeah, <laughs> the the game preview for this week just came out, so um and it reminded me that this weekend series is Thursday to Saturday. So That's right because Thursday. of Easter. Yep, your Easter lights. Yep. That's right. Get your Easter lights up in time so that you can sit down and watch baseball this weekend with Sam Houston at Liberty. Uh, The Flames, Ben, and you said there is a baseball preview up over on the exclusive Cat Fun section of Cat Fans? That's on, no, it's on the Sam Houston website. Oh, it's on the Sam Houston website. So everybody can go see it. Right. Yeah. It's just bearcats.com. Yep. Yeah. Kind of a general breakdown. They list the starters and probables and all that. Still, Listing Sunday is to be determined, but that should be Michael Watson. Um, looks like the weekend rotation is going to be Atkinson, Cold Iron, and Watson for the foreseeable future. So, um, all right, I yep. have a question. Yep, is because I don't know how the baseball co- college coaches do. Is the probables or starters that are listed there? Um, is that like the depth chart of the football team that you just kind of throw away because it's going to be the same every week? From what I have experienced in these last couple of years, it seems like what they put on there is going to happen. Um, And it looks like it's always right. I mean, especially on the weekend, you already kind of know who's going to start. Tuesdays might get a little iffy, but every Tuesday start seems to line up as well. So, um, yeah, I think it's the actual – guy who's going to go out there and start for you how is liberty this year yeah it's been a rough year for them um i think they're 10 and 14 and i think they were picked second to uh in the preseason poll to open up conference play and so it's definitely been a disappointing year for them i know they've dropped um most of their non-conference series coming into this week they took two out of three in their um conference usa opener last week so they did do that, but it is a team that has really struggled. And when they played quality competition, have not played well. I know they played Coastal Carolina, lost three out of four, and two of those losses weren't really close. They lost to Wake Forest last night, um, lost to a couple other teams that were decent. So, And I know some of their fans have been upset because it's been a disappointing basketball season and now a disappointing baseball season. So have seen some of that frustration and um I think they've lived up to expectations, but it's still tough to win on the road. Quick turnaround, flight out to Virginia, and you got to bring your A game, especially in conference play. Oh, yeah, it won't be easy, and they did. They got – oh, man, they got swept and swept by Coastal Carolina, and, and sometimes it hadn't been close. They they lost two of three to Hofstra. Uh, boy, they lost to Charleston. They lost all three to East lost Carolina. To Quinnipiac. Didn't they lose two out of three to Quinnipiac? Also? No, they won all three of those. That's oh, they won those. The okay. Their win, like they they lost their first opener to Canisius, and then they won. Uh, yeah, the, the competition has been up and down. Middle Tennessee, <laughs> wow. Yeah. All right, so eleven six. They they lose ten nothing, and then they win twenty five to nine. I saw I don't that. Know what yeah. you make they of set that. a school record for homers on that Sunday. I saw. I don't know what you make of that, right? Like, what what is Liberty? I don't know. We'll find out this weekend. Hopefully, they don't know who they are until after the Bearcats leave. Yeah, I mean, you're three and three to open conference play. I mean, you won two out of three on the road, and then you uh, you played Dallas Baptist. It's probably going to steamroll most of the league. That's not named Sam Houston, so. You're at three and three, but it would be really nice to come out of this weekend six and three, maybe five and four. I would really like to see six and three. I look, I go into a weekend series because baseball is one of those sports that uh, I believe you just need to win two thirds, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when you when you're in college, you win two games of every weekend, you're going to be fine. 
I think that would keep them in that good at large position too, if they can, they can pull in two wins. So good luck to the baseball team this weekend. Uh, and for those of you who earlier were listening, go cat fund. What the heck is cat fund? Right. Ben, tell them how they can get involved with the cat fund and what all they get for being involved with the, I'm going to go ahead and say it, the only NIL for Sam Houston. Yeah, Cat Fund NIL Collective benefiting Sam Houston athletes and all the money goes back to the athletes at Sam Houston. Um, a lot of different things you get by signing up starts by as little as $10 a month up to $1,000 a month. Um, access to exclusive content on Cat Fans, access to merchandise, uh, meet and greet events, practice access, just to name a few. Um, so definitely want to sign up. Our website is under some construction right now, but it should be back up in the next few days at cat-fund.com um, so you can sign up there um, any of the membership levels like i said starting at as little as ten dollars um, a month and we've had a lot of exclusive um, football and basketball content over the past couple of weeks um, so that's been going up for all of our viewers so definitely make sure to sign up here in the next few days is it under bridge repair construction i don't run well i was gonna say i don't run our website so i don't know but it's not bridge repair thankfully too soon? Yeah, what do, what do they say? It takes seven years before you can make a joke about like a, a tragic event or something like that? What Wasn't there some saying? See, I thought it was seven minutes. <laughs> well, then I think you're good to go. There we go. Seven <laughs> minutes it is. Because <laughs> I think we're, what, 36 hours removed now? Uh, you got to be at least, right? I was. You could have done it at 8 o'clock yesterday morning. There we go. There we go. <laughs> but... <laughs> Yes, get involved with the Cat Fund, especially once once that uh, website is back from its construction. <laughs> get on there, and, and for as little as $10 a month, you can't beat the deal. And another thing you can't beat is the quality of service, quality of product you're going to get from our friends over at Eternal Roofing. They use certain teed shingles, which are known to resist the weather superiorly, including hail and tornadoes and if they don't you can get them repaired they also last a long time as long as they don't need repaired and they look fantastic our friends over at eternal roofing are also specialists in commercial roofing they have the ability to accommodate your hvac system any other roof equipment while ensuring minimal minimal disruption to your operations during the installation or repair Give them a call or send them an email today for free detailed roof inspections, fast professional service, no high pressure sales pitch, exceptional workmanship warranties. They are your roofing and general contracting service. If you are within the throughout the Hill Country, the Houston area, and we just go ahead and say the entire state of Texas. Give our friends over there a call. When you go to the website, it, when you email, Taylor, Taylor at eternal roofing tx.com. I want you to also stop and go to that website for a minute. Eternal roofing tx.com. Go look at the gallery, see things that they've done, see the work. You'll see that craftsmanship is tremendous and that everything they tell you is true. You can also call the Montgomery office area code 936 215-8539. The Hill Country Office is area code 830-251-5673. We're heading into our final segment today, Ben. Uh, and we're talking some basketball. And I think, you know, about the team, they won the first round. They got all the way to the Conference USA Championship. Semifinal. Uh, Semifinal. That's right. They didn't quite make it championship. They get semifinal. Man, it was a long week of basketball for me. You got yeah. it. Um, it was. It, it, I mean, it's not like they played bad. They played well. I wish it, this is one of those years that I'm really, you know, this is when I start to have issues with the NCAA and the things that they've done when it comes to the NIT, because used to Sam Houston would automatically be invited to the NIT. Now 
Ben, it looks like a lot of teams were, were telling the NIT no thank you. And other teams like Sam Houston that would have been in there that maybe even received an invite also said no thank you. Seems like they did a lot more harm than good in this. Yeah, they did. Um, and it really, I mean, I guess we'll go back to the tournament. They played well against UTEP. You just shot 22 of 37 from the free throw line and lost by two. Um, you make you go 25 of 37 and you win the game. 25 of 37 still isn't that great. Um, so that was really uh it would have been shot three better foot. than 22. Yeah. <laughs> um that, that's really what did you in you definitely played good enough to win and be in the conference championship um and I think you probably were the best team in the conference but I mean that's just the way things play out and then from an NIT perspective um yeah Sam Houston would have been in the NIT if it was the same rules as years past but unfortunately we're catering to the power five power six conferences now and so Sam Houston didn't get an invite or an automatic bid um and then you just, I mean, you probably could have gone and played in the CBI or the CIT, but the CIT couldn't even fill out their whole bracket. And you had teams that won seven or eight games this year. That's just kind of a crappy tournament. Um, and then the well, CBI. And some of those tournaments, Ben, they make you pay to go play it. That's that's what I was going to say. You've got to pay for all the travel, um, all the all the room and board, all that kind of stuff, all the food. Um, and I just don't know if it's really worth it if you're just going to go play, I don't know, a team that went 14 and 18 in the regular season. Um, you might as well just focus on recruiting in the portal because that that is a job in and of itself uh, this time of year. I heard a college basketball coach last night in the Division II quarterfinals lament that in the era of the transfer portal, you have to recruit – not only other players to come play for you, but your own players again. You have to re-recruit them every day, and I, I kind of, that gave me pause for a minute, Ben. Because whether there's a portal or not, you should be recruiting your players every single day to want to stay there and be there and play for you. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's I think it's always been that way, but it, now it's just heightened, um, especially yeah. when, I mean, I know you're not supposed to, but there's <laughs> let's, definitely let's be honest, definitely... man. You give you get start giving players power, and people are gonna have an uproar, right? P people don't like when other people start getting power, and what really throws me for a loop on this are the, a lot of the people that get upset about players or someone else getting power are people who have no power. Be happy that someone else gets a little power. Maybe eventually it'll go to you. Just right. Saying. Yeah. And I mean, I don't really have a problem with it, but yeah, I mean, you've always had to kind of recruit your team to keep guys on board from year to year, especially recently, but now it's even heightened with the portal. You can transfer as many times as you want. Um, I know you're not supposed to reach out to other teams, players, but there's definitely coaches and members of staffs that are, recruiting people that are on other people's teams. And so you've got to deal with that. And so there's just so many moving parts and um, well, it's definitely difficult to, let to me deal also, with as a coach. Yeah, no, I, look, I get it. But, but let me also say something else. It's difficult as a player if you get cut and lose your scholarship uh, because they want to fill it with someone else, right? Like, and if you're going to allow that to happen, then you need, then you know what? The transfer portal is something you got to live with too. For so many years, these coaches have had their cake and ate it too when it comes to these players, right? The fact that the players are starting to say, we need to be treated well or whatever it is to be here. Now, like NIL, if they're demanding money and then don't give it to them. And if nobody gives it to them, then they're they're gonna not they're gonna maybe come back and play for you. But if you give them the money, they're gonna keep asking for more. It you know, it look, it's like it I have no problem with it. I have no problem with the kids making money. If they're requesting money from you, then obviously they're not playing for the game. I wouldn't want them on my team anymore. Right. And I mean, it's always been like this with coaches and ADs and um that kind of movement. And so now it's just at the player level. And I mean, we've seen it like I said, at the coaching AD level, and well, I, mean, I don't really have a problem with it at the player level either. What if we made it fair across the board? Because they they complain about this, right? So how would coaches feel if we made it fair across the board and coaches could only enter the coach portal for a minimum amount of time after the season ends? And in including in that, 
you know, but yet there is there a specific time frame they're allowed to cut a kid? No, well then they can be fired anytime. Right? I mean, that would be fair. That would be equal. Yeah. I I think the only thing they won't go that, for it, that, that bothers me is the portal opening while the season is still pretty much going on. Timing I mean, there's of it, very valid concern. Right. That's, That's the only valid thing concern. Yeah, in basketball, I think you can definitely do something about it because you're right in the middle of a semester. Football, I can understand why it opens when it does because you've got to get kids enrolled for the next semester if they're going to jump ship and move somewhere from semester to semester. Let's, but basketball has got to change. Let's talk about that for a second, though. Football is fine because it comes when you're already at the end of a semester, right? Like in the ones who enter the portal – are either guys who seems made a bowl and they don't want to play. So, okay. Or guys that didn't make, it. I'm fine with that. Like, I don't have a problem with the timing for football. And if any other sport in that kind of the same general time frame towards an end of a semester, but you start getting into problems and you're going to get into a problem here in baseball, I believe as well and softball and things of that nature. When you open up the portal immediately after the bracket is announced, you're going to have players leaving that are that whose teams are in the NCAA tournaments and they're going to enter the portal. And these aren't going to be just bench warmers. These are going to be, could be a starting pitcher, maybe your ACE, Right. Those things should not be happening. Now, the same, we want to be fair across the board. Ben, if if it's not fair for a kid to jump in the portal uh, when a team's going into the national tournament, maybe coaches shouldn't be leaving as a team goes into a national tournament. Like we, There's lots of ways we can fix this. I think with basketball, you need to extend it out probably at least a couple of weeks and probably the same for baseball too. Yeah. At least a couple of weeks, because when it opens for basketball, a third of the teams across the country are still playing. You've got 68 in the, uh, in the NCAA tournament, you've got 32, I believe it is in the NIT. Then you've got 30 or so more in the CIT and CBI. And so opening the portal when a third of the teams are still playing is, I don't know. I don't know how the, the NCAA comes to that decision. Just push well, it you're back. Asking, you're asking 33% of your coaches to not only worry about coaching a team in a tournament, a postseason tournament. A lot of times, if it's the, the March Madness, it's on TV everywhere, right? You're, you're judged by how you play in March, and you're also having to worry about going out and recruiting because the portal's only open for so often. It's just not right. It's not right on it's not right to the athlete. It's not right to the coaches. And when when you get it when it says it's not right to both athlete and coaches, and then by proxy fans, because the fans miss out on it too, you cover all three. It means it's time to move that date. It is. And I mean it's just a cluster, but honestly, what isn't a cluster when it comes to working with the NCAA? Speaking of a cluster, how many Bearcats have joined? I, I, I did. There's one big one that I was a, a little bit of a little sad to see join the portal. Yeah. So, so far you've had um, three scholarship players and four total. Um, the, the three scholarship guys, the names that people will know. Um, obviously, David Barnes is the big one. And then there's also Anthony Vashej and Lewis Rose. So, um you lose those three guys. Obviously, Barnes is probably the biggest hit. But as of right now, I mean, you still return a huge core of this last year's team. Um, right now, I, you've got Lamar Wilkerson coming back. Um, you've got Marcus Boykin, Cam Hoofner, Damon Nicholas, Kean Sraggins. Um, and so you've got a really core six there um between those guys and then you've got cj beaumont as well who showed some really good things as freshmen so that's a really core six and uh five of those guys all averaged i think seven or eight points or more this last season so you lose barnes you lose a couple depth guys but the fact that you return as of right now six quality guys that played for you this last year that's a win for a mid-major team well it is and and but losing barnes is a blow uh, is it, but is that one of those things where maybe he was just looking to see if he could go to maybe a power four school? Yeah, and I've heard the door's still open there. 
um, just based on conversations I've had. So just because he's in the portal doesn't mean it's confirmed for sure exactly. he's going to leave just yet. Exactly. An All-American and Lone Star Conference Player of the Year, Larry Weiss, was in the portal last year from West Texas A&M, and he's now playing for West Texas A&M in Evansville. Just That is important to remember just because a player enters the portal doesn't mean they're gone. Uh, it would if that coach stops recruiting them still, though, right? Like, yeah. And, and, <laughs> that's why it's so important for these coaches to always be recruiting your own players, too. Yeah, and just to kind of give a perspective on how important it is to bring back six players, the uh, 2023 to 2024 team, there were six players that transitioned from that team to this year's team. And really, I mean, you none of them were Quay Grant, Dante Powers, Tristan Ife, Casey Eziagu, Eziagu. You lost pretty much your entire starting five. Um, this year, you could return – uh, Marcus Boykin, Lamar Wilkerson, Damon Nicholas, Cam Hoofner, and Keegan Keegan Scroggins. And you could argue those were five of your six best players this year. And so, and we saw how good this year's team was despite losing so much from last year. Um, so I'm really excited because you returned six guys, five of them, um, I mean, or arguably five of your six best players. And we've seen when you transition um, from year to year with that many guys, that played that many minutes the year before your team the next year could be really good. So I'm still really excited and optimistic. Oh, the future's bright. The future is very bright. And if they, and if Barnes decides he would like to come back, we welcome him back. Of course it would be even better. And then, uh, you know, if Mudge is able to go out and add one or two, maybe from the portal that might be able to come in and be immediate help, that would be really nice because right now you're sitting at six. I would rather be at nine. Uh, that I know for depth purposes. Yeah. Uh, it, and then, you know, with injuries, that's going to get whittled down to about eight or seven throughout the year. So that's why you want to start with at least nine. Yeah. And you've got, you've got Bryce Cook as well. He really didn't play. He's another scholarship guy. So technically, you've got seven scholarship guys um, returning as of today, um, which in, with five or six of them having played a lot last year and, uh, I think you can almost make an upgrade from some of the bench guys you had last year. So I don't think it's honestly a bad thing that you've got six open scholarship spots right now. No, that's a lot of scholarships, a lot of people, free money, right, Ben? It's not free. You have to go to class. Right. Just saying it's not free. Nothing's free. That is true. When they say nothing is free in life, that is true. Yeah. Somewhere, somebody pays for it. Exactly. Somebody's paying. That's right. Usually at dinner, it's not me. <laughs> and that is a great note to end on today, Ben. I want to thank you so much for jumping on it. And, and thank you guys for all putting up with, uh, you know, the craziness that comes with dealing with uh, someone who can be a little scatterbrained on a podcast. So uh, I thought overall, though, I think, Ben, that we're going to keep our job this week. I think so. Yep. Uh, there was a lot of good content with a lot of uh, interesting conversations in between. Hey, some people like it. Some there people don't. Half fries. That's right. Make sure, make sure if you go out and you see calf fries on the menu that you go ahead and order those suckers. Yes. I'm right sure away. they're good. Get a hat. I mean, that thing is sweet. Yeah, get a hat. You can find them. They're on the Amarillo Sod Poodles team store page whatever that is they <laughs> minor league baseball probably has an entire shopping page for you oh yeah i'm sure there's a, a bunch of different ones out there oh yeah cool hats. i think a couple years ago the el paso chihuahuas had a margarita night Ooh, yeah margarita hat they did there you go they did and the chihuahuas is also a classic uh lo a logo to have too it is it is cool can you Almost imagine playing them, man? They'd nip at your heels and stuff. It'd be net. Ugh. Yeah. A chihuahuas, man. Get out of here, ankle biter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. That's going to do it this week. We hope that they allow us back on the air next week. <laughs> Again, we appreciate you. Thank you for listening. Without you, we're not able to do all this craziness. Until next time. Ben, the baseball team needs some wins. Yep. Let's go get a sweep and uh, eat them up, cats, and happy Easter. Another sweep. 
speed. 